In a recent video that I made about Alibaba, I made the comment that I don't mind if the share price remains under $100 per share even for the next 10 years. And some people got sort of like concerned about that comment. And so what I wanted to do was actually roll that whole concept into a Q&A video where I talk about why I would be comfortable in such a situation. And so guys, as you smash that like button, let me run that intro. What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. Now I thought the comment that I got was really funny. Well, this is just one of them and I'll share it with you guys quickly. I always get a kick out of these and so this is what the comment said. So I hid the commenters a name because I don't want anybody to go after him or anything like that. And so he's like, your credibility is gone. You want the stock under $100 for uh, 10 years, WTF. And I'm like, yup, I'm a net buyer. I hope all great companies remain cheap so I can continue buying them. And like, let's be real, I'm a net buyer for like the next 40 years. So you know, I like going to the mall when things are cheap. And then there was another comment under this where the guy's like, nah, you bugging. So let's actually roll this into uh, the question that I want to cover in this video. So the question for the Q&A series is, how do you actually make money with a stock investment effectively? And so let's dive into that. And first, I want to start with a quote from a Berkshire Hathaway annual letter. And so this is from the 1993 Berkshire Hathaway annual report and said, in the short run, the market is a voting machine reflecting the voters registration test that requires only money, not intelligence or emotional stability. But in the long run, the market is a weighing machine. And, you know, Buffett really likes to talk in like a folksy code. And so what I want to do is I want to add to this comment and I want to add to this using the Alibaba example that we're currently experiencing. And the reason why I'm putting this into the Q&A series is because I think that this lesson that we're going to learn here is relevant for a long time. And so, you know, let's for a second pretend that Alibaba Alibaba's share price remains under $100 a share for 10 years. Many would call that like a failure of an investment. And I would say it really depends on how the company performed during that time. So for example, if the business did not go according to plan and the share price actually reflects the true value of the business, then it actually was a bad investment. But that's not what we're really seeing right now. Right now, we're seeing Alibaba continue to um, operate in line with expectations. And so if the business performed well, and the company allocated the generated capital efficiently, that it actually was a great investment. And that's kind of like what we're seeing in this environment. So allow me to dive deeper into this concept. First, let me start with Alibaba. So Alibaba is a future focused ecosystem of interrelated businesses that are growing together with the continued emergence of China. Of course, you know, I've mentioned on this channel many times that there's lots of risks, both with Alibaba's competitiveness and China's competitiveness on a global stage and I've covered these extensively on this channel but a bet on Alibaba is a bet on the continued emergence of the Chinese economy and once again the emergence of China does come with risks and it's very well noted and you know priced into the valuations I would say a little bit too much in this environment and here's the crux of it and this is why a video like this is valid even like 10 years from now or 15 years from now the concepts will remain the same so if you assume that the businesses is going to grow out at the rates that I've been forecasting here, then what exactly does it mean if the share, the stock price doesn't go anywhere over the next 10 years? Because really what's happening is the company's continuing to operate, the company's continuing to grow revenue out at approximately 8% a year. So if the share price isn't going anywhere, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that you didn't make money as a shareholder? I would argue that you're not looking at the business properly and you don't really understand what a stockholder investment actually actually is. But this leads us to uh, the next concept that I want to talk about. But first, let me start with this. So if the stock is currently trading at 15.5 times free cash flow per share, which is net of the forecasted stock based compensation, which you can see right here. So it's 15.5 times earnings. Then in 10 years, if the company operates in line with expectations, it will be trading at approximately 7.7 .7 times earnings because, of course, the company has continued to generate higher and higher amounts of revenue. And so uh, the only way for the stock 
to remain at $100 per share 10 years from now is that the multiple has to be cut in half. Now, in addition to that, that assumes that the company doesn't allocate any excess capital to share buybacks, which of course they would be doing. So you probably wouldn't have a multiple 7.7 times. You probably have a multiple somewhere around like three times earnings or even less. So that's how uh, crazy the valuation would have to get in order for the share price to remain at $100 per share. So effectively what I'm saying is that the market would have to reprice the security otherwise it would be at breakneck valuations that's what's really happening here so what i'm really trying to get at is you need to stop focusing on the share price and focus on the operations is the company operating and growing its revenues in line with expectations and so remember guys that the this right here this free cash flow per share this is what you earn each year whether or not you see it in the stock price so if you're not seeing it in the stock price, where exactly is this money going? And that leads to the second part of this video, which I want to cover, which is where is the generated free cash flow going? So let's take a look. There's actually multiple ways that a company can deploy that free cash flow per share that it generates. So, you know, they can um, increase shareholders value with um, I would say at least four items and you know there there there's more ways to redeploy the capital than just this but most companies undertake a blend of these four options I would say so the first option they could do is reinvest it into the business at a reasonable rate of return so that's where that return on invested capital comes in two they can repurchase shares three they can leave the cash on the balance sheet or even like pay down debt and four, they can pay dividends. And so let's investigate all of these. And as we investigate them, I'm gonna explain how this increases shareholder value and inevitably ends up increasing the share price. So if the company reinvests into the business, the shareholders should see higher future earnings, so higher EPS, assuming that they reinvest at a high enough return on invested capital. If they don't, they're not good allocators of capital and you shouldn't be investing in that company. And so, you know, the shareholders should see higher future earnings per share, which are expected to increase the share price but you know this assumption assumes that the multiple remains the same or at least or at least it remains the same or it expands now if the company is increasing its EPS every year, the only way for the share price to actually remain the same, so say it's 100 bucks and you know 10 years from now it remains at 100 bucks, is if the multiple contracts. But remember what I told you, there's a certain point where the multiple will just have gone too far down, you know, talk about 10 years, the multiple could go from, you know, like the example that we showed, 15 to down to like three. Um, will the market allow a great company that's continuously increasing earnings and redeploying capital efficiently to trade at three times earnings, not unless it's a very unusual black swan type situation. So eventually the stock has to rebound. It is inevitable that the stock has to reprice itself at least to the same multiple, e even if it's like a low multiple, it still has to reprice to that level. So as a shareholder, you make money because your stock price has to go up. The second thing the company can do is repurchase shares. So here, you know, all things remaining equal is effectively assuming that the earnings re remain the same as a whole, but those same earnings get split over fewer and fewer shares as the company is using those earnings every year to buy back stocks. And so shareholders will see a higher earnings per share, even though the earnings for the company overall remains the same. And that higher earnings per share is expected to increase the share price. But once again, that assumes that the multiple remains at least the same, uh, if not expands. And so what happens is the only way for the share price to remain the same uh, over many, many years in this situation is once again, if the multiple contracts. But like I said, there's only so far that the multiple can go down. It's not going to trade at three times earnings, especially for a company that's allocating capital well and has a strong uh, position in its marketplace. So you have to inevitably make money. Otherwise, the company will just get too cheap. And in that situation, somebody will probably just come and buy it out anyways. Now, the third option is when the company generates free cash flow, it, they can actually just leave that cash on the balance sheet. And so this will increase the excess capital amount, which actually rolls into the valuation. And remember guys, if you look at any of the models that I built, notice I have the discounted future earnings plus or minus 
excess capital because sometimes uh, companies have a lot of debt, so I subtract that from their ultimate valuation. But you know, if they have a ton of excess capital, it adds to the valuation. For those of you who want an example of this, take a look at the meta model in the tracker that I have. You can see that they have a ton of excess capital, which adds to the valuation. Same with Alibaba. Alibaba has a lot of excess capital as well, which also adds to the valuation. This is why both of those companies are buying back lots of shares. And so this is expected to increase the share price because you have to add that excess capital to the uh, discounted cash flows. But, you know, the assumption there is that the market recognizes this. And in many cases, the market doesn't react to this. So it's not recommended that a company just keeps cash on the balance sheet. For many years, Apple had a ton of cash on their balance sheet and analysts were essentially begging them to start paying a dividend and buying back shares, just get it off their balance sheet. The other problem with having cash on the balance sheet is it brings down your return on invested capital because de facto, just by keeping cash on the balance sheet, although you didn't really deploy it, a decision to keep the cash on the balance sheet is a capital decision and it's a very low yielding capital decision. So it can speak to the management's inability to deploy capital efficiently if they keep it on the balance sheet. And that's a, a, a mark against the management. And so you don't want to leave it on the balance sheet, but you know, uh, in the interim periods, you will see, uh, or you can see cash potentially build up on balance sheets as management decides what to do with it. And finally, the company can pay dividends Dividends. And this one's the easiest one to understand because if the company's paying out most of the generated capital as dividends, all other things um, assumed to remain constant, the value of the business should largely remain the same because the company is just making money and they're paying that money out. The future earnings um, generating capability of the company remains the same. And so it has the same value. The shareholders generate a return as it's paid out. And, you know, the other thing is that a dividend paying organization may actually attract a different type of investor, an income investor, who may be willing to pay more for a consistent and reliable dividend paying organization. So this might actually increase the value. But that's the fourth uh, way that a company can uh, pay out capital. But effectively, uh, what I'm saying there is that, you know, those first three methods, you're actually generating our earnings and free cash flow as an owner. So just because the share price isn't going anywhere doesn't mean that you're not making money. And that's the point that I want to make. The point of this whole video is to not look at the share price. That's not how you're generating income. You're generating income by the operations of the company. The stock will inevitably have to reflect the value of the company or the company just gets cheaper and cheaper, assuming that the company's operating in line with expectations. And so finally, let's answer the question. Why why would you want the share price of your company to not move for 10 years or more? Well, the answer is if the company continues to operate well and the stock remains disconnected from the business fundamentals, then I have an opportunity to concentrate my position into a company that's getting cheaper and cheaper as time goes on. Because I'm a net buyer for the next 40 years, I will absolutely take advantage of this. And great companies don't come that often. So if a great company remains cheap for an extended period of time, I welcome it. So that's the answer to that question. And if you guys have any questions or comments, let me know in the comments below. Also, I believe that this Q&A series is the most important part of this channel. And so that's why I've made a playlist of all the videos. And so if you've missed any of the videos, you can actually get access to those right here.